Hey, Annie, guess what? What? We just launched a business of biotech newsletter. Yeah? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. What am I thinking? We don't need another <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, I might have been thinking that. Annie, I swear on my grandpa's grave, you're going to like this newsletter. That's a pretty bold swear, Matt. Uh, hear me out. It's monthly. Only once a month. It's ad-free. And it's modeled after the Business of Biotech podcast. It's got the same insight from the builders of biotech that you see in the podcast. So what's not to like? That actually sounds like it doesn't suck. Pretty high praise, Annie. Check it out. Bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Go there and sign up for this newsletter. You won't regret it. What happens when a new biopharma company decides to develop therapeutics for some of the most prevalent cancers using the hottest therapeutic modality we've seen since the antibody and to develop them in such a way as to enable modular and closed small footprint nano chip directed manufacturing. Well, that company gets a lot of attention for the nut it's trying to crack. And such is the case with the aptly named nutcracker therapeutics, which aims to address HPV driven tumors, T cell lymphoma and genitourinary tumors using RNA therapeutics. Earlier this year, Nutcracker landed a $167 million Series C to further its work. And for nearly a year now, one of the people responsible for guiding that work is Dr. Jeff Nosrati, Chief Business Officer at Nutcracker. On today's show, we're going to get to know Dr. Nosrati. Uh, we're going to get to learn about Nutcracker's therapeutic approach, its unique manufacturing strategy, and how that manufacturing strategy maps to the success of the business. Dr. Nosrati, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. Uh, and I'm super excited to learn about what you guys are doing uh, in this very hot area of, uh, of, of biotech and also uh, to affect the, the lives of patients and, uh, I mean, an, an increasingly large number of patients in this HPV driven uh, cancer arena. Uh, but before we get into some of those conversations, I want to get to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, one of the things that jumps out at me when I look at your, uh, I guess, evolution, the evolution of your career is that you started out as a scientist earning your PhD in, what do we have, biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, so you came out of came out of your PhD work, uh, did some work as a scientist, went to McKinsey, and it seems like it, it all kind of shifted to strategy and business development kind of uh, focused work after McKinsey. So tell us about that pivot. Sure. So actually, to clarify, I went straight from grad school to McKinsey. Uh, so all of my lab work as a scientist was actually before I returned to grad school. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, um, I think I've, um, to give a somewhat incomplete answer, I, I've always been interested in tying disparate fields together. Uh, I did my PhD work in biochemistry in a lab whose core focus uh, was theoretical uh, or computational physical organic chemistry. Uh, so I was kind of the lone biochemist amongst uh, a set of organic and physical chemists, uh, but it was a great experience. I like to tie together uh, fields that don't normally work together. Uh, and in some sense, uh, what I'm doing now is a natural extension of that. So tying together the business side and the science side uh, of my background, it's actually been a pretty, it's a pretty fun experience for me because I always like learning new things. Um, and so that that made the transition from you know grad school one day into management consulting the next day uh, a pretty a pretty exciting experience for me, uh, and I learned a ton during that process. Yeah, what's uh, so I'm going to ask you a, a follow up question to that, and it's a very uh, it's a very theoretical question. But what's you, you say you like to sort of marry two disciplines together and figure out how to do that, and where they you know perhaps where they jibe. What's uh, what's an easier marriage? the science to science that you experienced in your academic career, like marrying uh, a science to a science that are perhaps in some ways disparate or, or, or science to business. I think science to business is harder, uh, not necessarily intellectually harder, uh, but it's, it's definitely different mindsets. You know, scientists, in general, are always looking for truth and the best possible answer to everything. Uh, in business, uh, you have to learn to make compromises. Um, not that you're not looking for things that are true, but that sometimes you make, you get to make, so get to or have to make decisions based on very incomplete data, uh, which is pretty unsatisfying scientifically. Uh, but there are, you know, as you get further and further away from the lab, the definitive answers to questions uh, melt away uh, and you end up making probabilistic bets a lot of the time. And that's something that if you want to be on the business side, 
you need to get comfortable with mm, um, because yeah. certainty is um, <laughs> rare in, in making business decisions. Yeah, I can imagine that can be difficult for some uh, some folks who are brought up in the in the scientific cloth. Yes, uh, it's it's a transition, and you know, so uh, you know, from my time at McKinsey, I worked with a bunch of folks who are coming straight from you know professional school, med school, grad school, uh, also many MBAs. Um, but you know, folks who were more trained in sort of finding the right answer at all costs to finding business appropriate answers with the right level of risk, it's it's a tough transition. Um, it takes some time to get used to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I want to jump though. We could, we could, uh, spend quite a bit of time, I think, talking about your sort of upbringing in the space and the evolution of your, of your, uh, of your business, uh, career strategy career in, in bio, but I want to, we don't have a whole lot of time here, but, but I've got a lot of questions about Nutcracker and what you guys are doing. So forgive me. We'll have to have you on, on for a part two to talk about your, uh, your CV sometime, <laughs> but, but I want to get right into this discussion around, around RNA and what, what uh, Nutcracker is doing with it. And, and I want to start at the highest levels. I don't want to make any assumptions about, you know, where our audience is coming into this conversation. Um, so I want to start at, at I, I think the, the highest level question I can ask you um, for your perspective on, as it relates to this modality or family of modalities, as it were, I'm not even sure how to describe it. <laughs> What is so, why is it so hot right now? What is it? RNA, mRNA, ORNA, uh, I, you know, SIRNA, um, sir, I'm sorry, circular RNA, anything RNA is, is getting all sorts of attention right now. Why is that? Okay. Well, there's an obvious answer, uh, which I'm going to give, and I'll give you, uh, I'll try to give you a more sophisticated answer. So the obvious answer is COVID. Uh, so the COVID vaccines made RNA a household word. Um, and that's, that wasn't true before the pandemic. Uh, so, that's one reason why I think RNA is getting a lot of attention. Um, but I think the, the more sophisticated answer would be that really this groundwork has been laid for the last two decades. Uh, so we saw our first siRNA drug that was Al Nylum's uh, on Patro approved in, I think, 2018. Um, and Moderna and BioNTech and CureVac on the mRNA side have been building you know, their platforms for you know, the last 10 or more years. So uh, RNA, the foundation of RNA was laid you know, quite some time ago. Yeah. That being said, there's been a lot of validation in a very short period of time due to these recent approvals, plus the pandemic and the vaccines. Uh, and so now you have multiple siRNA products on the market. You have multiple mRNA products on the market. And that has stirred up a huge frenzy around RNA. Um, the other thing that makes RNA so complex, as you pointed out, is there's a lot of ways to go after RNA uh, as medicine. Mm -hmm. So there's RNA as a therapeutic, but that's what siRNA is, right? The RNA itself is the drug that acts on the body. Yeah. There's mRNA-based drugs uh, where you know the, the RNA encodes the therapy. That would be how the vaccines work. Uh, and then finally, there are small molecule or let's say molecular modifiers or modulators of RNA. And there's other companies going after that approach. So it spawned a whole host of appro therapeutic approaches to, to RNA, whether you're using the RNA as the drug itself, the RNA to encode the drug, or you're using other molecules to affect RNA. And I think the combination of all those factors, the multiple ways you can attack RNA, um, the convergence of the vaccines and the SR, siRNA products, that's probably how you got to the, this, this flurry of attention uh, and investment around RNA-based approaches uh, to developing therapeutics. And all of those are very different, um, but they each have potential to affect patients' lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, to, and to those of us who are not scientists, it's also, it, it creates a lot of confusion. It creates a lot of confusion. <laughs> similarly, you know, similar to like cell and gene therapies, you know, like, is it, is it fair to call a therapeutic that affects a gene, right? That, 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 that impact, like that perhaps a silence is, is that a, is that a gene therapy or is a gene therapy like something that requires manipulation of the gene in a more physical way? Same thing with cell therapy. Like in this space, can you draw any corollaries between like, if you, if you, Jeff Nosrati, if it were up to you to be king of the world and come up with your own taxonomy, I suppose, or, or you know, categorization approach to how, RNA therapeutics, you know, what they're considered, what, what's the modality, what's not, what would you take beyond that? This is a total, total question out of left field. That's true. And if I get to be king of the world, I hope to do a lot more than that. But <laughs> the one thing I get to do as king is, I think the classification 
I put forth is, is the right way to think about RNA medicines. And they're all very different. So when you talk about RNA-based medicines, it's important to talk about, again, is the RNA the drug? Mm-hmm. Is the RNA encoding the drug? Or are we looking to modulate RNA with some other type of molecule? Yeah. If you can get yourself sorted into one of those categories, you'll have a much better sense of where your, your therapeutic applicability really is. So siRNA or RNA is the drug is generally more of a gene silencing approach. Mm-hmm. Um, mRNA as you know, uh, RNA is the coding entity for the drug. Then you're generally using RNA as a tool to produce a therapeutic protein. And that protein could be an antigen, as it is in the case of the spike vaccines, or it could be something else. Uh, and um, though, though that can also be a, a therapeutic approach that makes sense. Yeah. And then there's small molecules to affect RNA. And then it can make RNA more or less stable. It can make it, uh, it can turn on genes or turn off genes by stabilizing or destabilizing RNA. Yeah. Once you sort of know what, what flavor of RNA you're working with, you'll have a much better sense of the types of things you might do with it. And that gives you at least some handle on how to manage this. So circular RNA, for example, just like linear mRNA is generally used for protein production. So that's RNA encodes the drug. Uh, and so if you can put something into one of those three buckets, you'll at least have a reasonable sense of the types of drugs you're talking about and how they're intended to work. I like that. Um, I appreciate that too, uh, that education. Where, uh, w- Which of those three buckets is Nutcracker working in? So we are in the second bucket. We are in the RNA encodes the drug. So we are generally interested in using RNA to create therapeutic proteins to exert an effect on the body. Uh, the 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 other molecule uh, affecting RNA in the body that you know we're we're not even going to classify that uh, in the realm of our conversation here because we're we're bio like we're large molecule that's a that sounds like we wouldn't even call that a biologic correct right so I think largely and I'm not an expert in this space that's largely being done with largely being done with small molecules those would be more classical small molecules uh, I'm sure it's possible to do with larger molecules and there may be some folks working on that um, I don't I don't track that space nearly as closely as I do uh, the RNA encodes the therapeutic space. Yeah, totally fair. Okay. So I want to get to know, um, I want to get to know Nutcracker's approach a little bit more closely. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to pick apart some of your own uh, verbiage, right? On your website. Fair enough. Is that cool? Um, Yep. Nutcracker has created a platform that quote, this is Nutcracker's words, not mine, harnesses the molecular versatility of RNA to overcome clinical development bottlenecks and bring forth life-saving therapies more efficiently. The back half of that, we get that. I think to a degree, you can explain, you know, maybe in detail how, how, how so everybody wants to bring forth life-saving therapies more efficiently. But um, what, what, for, first of all, let, let's uh, help me understand what the development bottlenecks around, um, around RNA are. Cause you know, I'm going to, I'm going to just jam two questions into one here. Like, Development, uh, development bottlenecks, the impression that the world got as a result of what you mentioned earlier, the fact that the COVID uh, vaccine, um, you know, made, made RNA a household term, uh, the impression the world got was like, you know, the entire thing is just inherent with efficiency. Like we were able to, you know, create a vaccine that normally would take 15 years and, you know, a matter a matter of months. So what kind of bottlenecks are we talking about here? I thought, you know, I thought RNA was supposed to be this panacea for uh, drug development efficiency. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, let no, me take these. Listen, <laughs> if, if uh, when, whenever I talk to a, a scientist like you, the most ingratiating thing you'll find about me is my simplification of, of, of everything. So I'll come at you at 30,000 feet. Don't get mad at me. Just bring us down where we need to be. No, no, no. It, it, it's a good question. So certainly the development of the COVID vaccines was extraordinarily rapid. Part of that was due to RNA, absolutely, because of its inherent flexibility, and we'll talk about that. Part of that was because also um, we, as both regulatory agencies and as a society, were willing to take some risk with the development path. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes uh, the, the vaccinology community prior to RNA gets unfair, uh, unfairly characterized as being slow. Uh, vaccine development is hard for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and, you know, a vaccine is something you give to a healthy person. So the, the, the standard for safety around a vaccine is extraordinarily high in normal circumstances. And so those trials take a long time for yeah. a reason. And we really want to be ensure, uh, assured of the fact that a vaccine is safe before it's given to a human being who is essentially healthy otherwise. Um, 
other than not having an immunity to whatever disease you're vaccinated against. Yeah. So definitely a lot to applaud about how RNA vaccines can be developed quickly, uh, but it's not as though vaccinologists were holding back the field, making vaccine development slower on purpose. Um, it's always a question when you develop a new medicine of risk benefit ratio. Mm-hmm. In a global pandemic, unknown disease causing you know a, a lot of death around the world, it makes sense to aggressively push things through the clinic and into patients because they can benefit from that. So I don't want to criticize you know, the, the vaccinologists uh, you know, of prior times because of the decisions they made. There's, there's always risk in new medicines, and, and uh, that affects sure. vaccine development timelines. Yeah, and my, my allusion to that 15-year timeline was, was not critical. It was just uh, comparative, right? So I'm saying, yes. you know, get back to this efficiency uh, conversation around RNA. You know, I'm looking at it going like, yep. well, it, you know, everyone sort of got the impression that the efficiency w- was inherent. So, um as right. we sit today and and pivoting, I want you, I want to give you the opportunity. I think I'm going to do you a favor here, pivot away from this vaccine conversation to RNA therapeutics. Mm-hmm. As it relates to RNA therapeutics, what sort of development bottlenecks do we still, you know, do we, does the industry generally still face? Right. So some of the nice things about RNA in terms of drug development um, are well, even before you get into the clinic, it's a very efficient platform for screening a lot of different protein constructs. Mm-hmm. So you can make RNAs that encode a bunch of different proteins you want to evaluate therapeutically very quickly. Uh, so for us to make 50 to 100 or even more different constructs to evaluate for the same indication is a relatively fast procedure compared to doing it conventionally. Mm-hmm. So you get an efficiency advantage early on in discovery, just from it being able to screen rapidly and efficiently and take constructs through sort of the protein design stage um, all the way through in vitro and in vivo studies uh, in a rapid and efficient manner. So you're, you're, you're winning already on the discovery side. Um, that's just, that's hugely uh, effective because at that point you, you have to choose a lead candidate to move in, you know, based to move into the clinic based on that data. Um, that works if you can get your RNA fast enough. Uh, we are, of course, blessed by having our own RNA platform and production capabilities in-house. So we can have that RNA supply be steady uh, uh, and available to us uh, throughout our discovery efforts. Mm-hmm. I guess the second bottleneck you're always dealing with after research is a manufacturing bottleneck. Uh, and this is there's both a general bottleneck and an RNA-specific bottleneck. Um, if you are a, a quote, whatever normal is, but a normal biotech company, you're going to outsource your manufacturing. Um, you'll go to one of the big CDMOs. You'll reserve a slot. There's probably now an 18 to 24 month lead time to get a slot to even have your product made. Um, and it's very expensive. So that's a bottleneck for everybody, right? Because it's not like you can walk over across the street to your CDMO and say, here's my protein, please make it tomorrow. And no, it's going to be two years from now that the protein ends up, you know, in vials ready to be administered to patients. Um, so RNA is, you know, RNA for us, at least it can be very different, right? Uh, with RNA, you're always generally making the same thing. I'm, I'm going to make the CMC people cry a little bit by saying that, but generally you're making ribonucleotide polymers. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether it encodes drug A or drug B, it's still RNA. So you, you get a lot of uh, advantages of commonality between production. Um, when you're, when you're, when you're manufacturing RNA. So you have, you sort of skip past, if you have the ability to produce RNA, you skip past those bottlenecks with regard to having to get a slaughter to CDMO. Um, and, uh, you have some specific bottlenecks out there with regard to RNA production right now. If you don't have internal capacity, you have to find someone to make it for you. Um, and while we're generally pretty good now at making huge batches of one composition, there is a bottleneck in the industry about uh, just getting getting small batches of GMP grade material made for clinical trials and such. Yeah. So. Yeah. The and general bottleneck. Sorry. Go ahead. No. I, no. I was just going to say the uh, you, you're alluding to the ma- manufacturing uh, paradigm, and and I do want to I do want to spend some. We're gonna we're gonna get. I've got some questions for you around that because. Okay. I mean, I've, I've done a little bit of research into Nutcracker's approach and. Uh, I'm, I'm super anxious to learn about that. I mean, just the, the imagery, even what you guys are looking to develop is, uh, is pretty fascinating. Um, but I was curious, so you mentioned, you know, 
you, you, <laughs> I don't want to make the CMC guys mad either. We have a lot of CMC guys in our, in our audience. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, Hey, what well, it, it, the CMC is simply a matter of encoding for drug A or drug B. I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to assume that that speaks to the molecular versatility of RNA also, also words that are within uh, the, yep. the words I took off your website. So, so tell me about that. Like when it comes to, you may, maybe even in the context of Nutcracker's sort of origin story, you know, did the company say, hmm, we've got this, this, this vehicle that demonstrates great molecular versatility, therefore, you know, and, and we have some amazing science that we can perhaps leverage to create therapeutics around this vehicle, therefore, let's go create a cancer therapeutic, or was it more like wh- wh- what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, the 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 realization that you could leverage this molecular versatility or the realization that we want to go create um, therapeutics for specific um, indications? So great question. Uh, so one thing to note is that Nutcracker was actually formed in, in 2018. Uh, so before the pandemic, uh, this is really our CEO's realization of the therapeutic power of RNA. Uh, but he comes point. from a semiconductor background. Uh, yeah. Uh, so his, you know, his vision at first was really just to say, how can we make these molecules more efficiently? Uh, and so really the platform came first. Uh, and so as you invent ways to make RNA, you, you, you realize all the things that are challenging about making RNA and all the problems you need to solve, including the design of the sequence, how you deliver the RNA as a therapeutic, and how you make a very unstable molecule uh, in such a way that it can be done reliably and reproducibly. Uh, and be stable enough to give to human beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, But really the platform came first and the decision to deploy it with a therapeutic focus came a little bit later. uh, As you decide, if you have an RNA platform, the ability to make GMP grade RNA, what's the best way uh, to turn that into a a company, into a business? Uh, And uh, that's where the therapeutic focus came from. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you could probably gather from my sort of introductory monologue. Uh, I looking at Nutcracker as a subject uh, uh, of a conversation for a a podcast, I'm going like, I'm super intrigued by the indication angle. I mean, HPV head and neck cancers are just a scourge, right? And and it's going to be some time, some time before those HPV vaccines have an impact on the population of people that those head and neck cancers will affect. Sometime meaning what? Three decades, I think, is is the common consensus. So there's a, an incredible story we could spend an hour on on there, and and we'll get to the indications. Incredibly intrigued, obviously, by the fact that if we put RNA on any piece of content that we produce here at Life Science Connect, it gets all sorts of attention. Right. Um, but also this manufacturing paradigm there, you guys are your, your platform. And I know I'm jumping around here, Jeff. So if I'm, if I'm giving you short shrift uh, to, to respond on any of these specific questions, feel free to hit the rewind button. You won't offend me. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask about the platform process. Uh, it's, it's holistic, as I said, small footprint from design to fill finish under one roof. And when I say roof, it's almost like a roof of a, of a pod, right? I'm not talking about a, a, a 300,000 foot manufacturing facility. Um, I, I'm probably making a terrible verbal illustration right now. So I'll let you do it. Walk us through what this manufacturing physical put, footprint looks like. Yeah, happy to. And you're actually not too wrong about the size of everything. Um, you really don't need much of a footprint to make RNA, but <laughs> Our platform, the manufacturing side of the platform, at least starts around the system which we call the Nutcracker Manufacturing Unit, or NMU. Uh, if I use that acronym, that's what I mean. Uh, this is a, essentially a, a small-scale system uh, that's biochip-based, microfluidically controlled, and it's designed uh, to essentially be a closed-loop system for the production of GMP-grade um, RNA. And this system is modular, so the, as you when you uh, you can change its function by swapping out the biochip. So we have a, a, a biochip focused on template production, which is the DNA you need to serve as you might imagine uh, the template for RNA. Uh, you have a biochip that's based around IVT or in vitro transcription, which would be used to produce drug substance, and then we have a biochip uh, based around. Uh, formulation, which would then put the drug substance into nanoparticles, which would then generate drug product. Mm-hmm. So that's you know our you know our core technology uh, for production of RNA is the Nutcracker manufacturing unit, uh, and it's you know it's it's relatively small. You know essentially it fits into you can see a, a, an, a at least a um, 
a representative illustration of it on our website. You know, it's basically the size of a fume hood or a biosafety cabinet. Um, and that can be used for all the steps of manufacturing RNA. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biofarmers turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need to know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash emerging biotech. Like I said, I know I'm jumping around here, but uh, while, while we're talking about this unit, why, why is that small physical footprint uh, important? Like, why is that strategic for Nutcracker? What, what's sort of the long-term vision for, for that? Um, so the key, the key to the system is, well, there's a whole bunch of keys, but number one is scalable uh, so that you can run one cycle or many cycles to produce more or less RNA because you don't always need that much RNA. Mm -hmm. um, you can also scale it out rather than scale it up. So we want more capacity. We just add more machines. Um, and those are the things, you know, that, that's, that's scalability and being able to be either small scale or large scale uh, is enormously important in RNA. And I'll give you an example of why. So uh, at least in the clinic so far, most RNA doses are extremely small. Yeah. So the vaccine doses range from 30 micrograms for the Pfizer vaccine to 100 micrograms uh, for the, um, for the, for the uh, Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and if you compare that to you know, classical biologics, let's take a, a, a very well-known biologic, Keytruda, pembrolizumab, uh, Merck's uh, anti-PD-1 drug. Um, that's typically dosed flat at 200 milligrams. So a gram of material is five doses. Uh, a gram of RNA uh, for Moderna is 10,000 doses or 33,000 doses for, um, for, for the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. So for clinical trials, you know, having a gram of material is a ton of, of, of material. Like you don't need that much. So having scalable production that is right sized uh, is really important in RNA. And it's just in general, there's a few exceptions to this, much, much smaller scale than any sort of conventional biologic production uh, because of the nature of RNA itself. Mm -hmm. So being able to go, be small or big uh, to vary your lot sizes, to vary your production capacity by adding or subtracting machines is really, really important. And, that, and that's part of the, the power of the platform is its scalability, the scale out rather than scale up model. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, what about, if, if I look at, if I look at the footprint of, of this unit, I think you know, it's, it's hard for my mind not to go to, Oh, that lo looks mobile. Like there, there's, there's, a, could be a mobility play here. Are we talking like the potential to uh, develop and, and manufacture off site? Are we talking about the ability to make these things portable to serve, you know, uh, in communities uh, or per perhaps geographies that don't have access to great big, GMP facilities for other therapeutics. Is that part of the plan or is it, or is it more like, Hey, right now we're just, we're talking about keeping these things under our roof and, and perhaps building them out in that, in that space. Um, so you definitely could do things like that you know, if you have the right infrastructure um, to do so. So they are in a controlled environment. It is a GMP manufacturing facility that we operate them in. Mm -hmm. uh, so those things are, those requirements are still going to be there. Uh, the question of distributed manufacturing is, actually a pretty interesting one. And we could, there's a, there's a rabbit hole to be gone into uh, yeah. on this a topic. Rabbit hole. Uh, let, let me save you, Jeff, real quick. You're, you know, be, before you get yourself into a PR and investor relationships nightmare by making forward looking statements, <laughs> 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 statements right? No, I get it. Yeah. There, it, 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 as I said, it just naturally occurs to me that there is the opportunity for potentially right. Distributed manufacturing. Yeah, we've certainly thought about it, and, and there there is an opportunity just because you don't need a you know a five hundred thousand square foot facility to make RNA. You can mm -hmm. do it on a relatively small footprint again because of the relatively low doses needed. Um, you still need um, you still need the ability to uh, to process your drug, you know, do fill finish, get it into vials, distribute it to people, keep it cold so it doesn't uh, it doesn't it doesn't de degrade too rapidly. Uh, those things are you know a challenge in general for drugs. But the space you need to make RNA is much, much smaller than conventional therapeutics. Yeah. Yeah. Very good.
All right. I'm going to let you choose your own adventure because I'm at a juncture in this conversation where I could go either way. Do you want to talk about your uh, sizable series C and what you're going to do with that and what it's fueling right now uh, and, and into the near future? Or do you want to talk about those indications that, that you know, I, I mentioned HPV related head and neck cancers. There, there are others. I think we, uh, so let me, let me see if I can remember. There was a, um, a, a, uh, I want to say a u- urinary. So we, we have both uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma as well as genital urinary tumors. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we, you want to talk about, you want to talk money or indications next? Uh, I'll say a few words about money, just at, at, if, for, if for no other reason than to acknowledge our terrific investors who we very much appreciate. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, just to touch on that, uh, I think you mentioned it briefly. Uh, do you have questions directly or should I just speak to it? You speak to it. If I have follow up questions, okay. I'll let you know. But yeah, I, I did mention 167 million, I think, Series C just uh, yep. spring, springtime, was it? Yeah, we announced it then. Uh, so yeah, so we are we are uh, fortunate to have some outstanding investors. Uh, our lead investor is Arch Venture Partners. Uh, really, it's through through Bob Nelson's help that we were able to put together this very nice fundraise. Uh, and we're certainly appreciative of their support. Uh, I think you know, a Nutcracker is kind of emblematic of, of the types of bets that uh, Arch likes to make. Um, and so we're very happy to be part of that family. Um, you know, the keys to, to making this work, uh, I, I'd like to think that we have extraordinarily compelling technology in terms of the platform itself. Again, we have this end-to-end RNA platform. We have the capability to design RNA. We have our own nanoparticle-based delivery vehicle technology. And we have the Nutcracker manufacturing unit systems that I, that I just spoke about. Mm-hmm. So that platform play is in itself, I, I'd like to think, extremely compelling. And then on top of that, we have the therapeutics. So we have a lot of levers uh, to create value, um, which I, I, I like to think that the investors found that story very compelling. Uh, and that really was what I think drove our success, but really a ton of help from our lead investor yeah. along the way. How we'll use the money, uh, you're probably not surprised to hear, you know, continued investment in our platform. Uh, we think that it represents a substantial technological edge, uh, competitive advantage for us, and we'll continue to make our platform better on all the three aspects I described, on the RNA design side, on the delivery side, and of course, on the manufacturing side. Uh, and the other thing, of course, we're doing is advancing our pipeline as fast as we can and expanding it. So those are the two core areas of our funding. As you know, of course, as you move into the clinic, things get very expensive. So having cash reserves to drive assets forward through the clinic you know, as rapidly as we can is of critical importance. Yeah. Uh, you joined, I, I think I also mentioned that you, it, it's not quite been a year, uh, since yep. you joined the company. So you, you joined sort of in the sort of, sort of parallel with the, uh, w- with the, the series C. So obviously, I mean, b- besides uh, an outstanding paycheck that came along with that, uh, <laughs> that, that C round, uh, what, what else led you to Nutcracker? What else appealed to you about coming to work for Nutcracker? I mean, as, as I said, you've got some, uh, I don't know, you, you've worked for three or four different biopharmas, I believe in, yep. in kind of, uh, chief business officer type capacities, um, multiple modalities. What was it about Nutcracker that, that kind of drew you? Uh, so I think it's a, a lot of people are drawn to RNA for its flexibility. So there's a great, um, yeah, I feel like with COVID vaccines, we kind of only touched the surface of the, the, the mRNA iceberg or the tip of the mRNA iceberg. Mm-hmm. There are a, a huge number of novel ways to apply uh, mRNA as a therapeutic that I'm excited about. Uh, so the first, you know, first and foremost, the science was extremely appealing. Um, the other thing, well, there's many other things, but another key driver for me was having the platform. So it's very hard to be an mRNA company if you don't have a delivery solution, if you don't have a design solution. And honestly, right now, it's really hard if you don't have a manufacturing solution because of some of the capacity bottlenecks that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Having all of that under one roof uh, is extremely appealing uh, for, 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 for me at, from a corporate strategy perspective. Um, there's another uh, thing about manufacturing that I love, or at least controlling your own manufacturing, and that you're not beholden to the timelines and costs of, of going to an external vendor for drug supply. Mm-hmm. Um, having managed that you know, previously, uh, I know that it's just, um, it's very challenging, right? You're always fighting for slots. Uh, you're spending a bunch of money. Uh, it's an intrinsic time bottleneck uh, in anything that you do clinically. Um, and having not having that bottleneck is, is terrific. It's also, again, 
it's not free, but the incremental cost of adding a new lots of material uh, for clinical use for us is relatively low because we we have the facility is ours. We control our own production. And so the incremental cost of production is, is relatively low. So it makes it possible for us to do more in the clinic uh, than a company without its own manufacturing capabilities. Yeah. That's not free, right? You have to pay for your own facility. You have to staff it. You have to have a technology that can be capable of such. Uh, but if you do, uh, the incremental cost of doing more in the clinic uh, is low. And so that is extremely appealing because um, because of the nature of drug development. It's always better to have more good shots on goal uh, because of the inherent unpredictability of drug efficacy in the clinic. Sure. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, you you also embrace, you have to be prepared to, in that, in that paradigm, to embrace uh, challenges that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily have to have expertise to address if you did outsource. Um, Absolutely so true. I'm interested in your, your perspectives on that. Like the supply chain is a, is a, is a perfect example. You're, you know, you're saying, and, and rightfully so, you know, we're, we're re- resting control internally of, of, of our, of our supply and our capacity. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you gotta be brave to want to take responsibility for supply in this current, uh, in, environment we're in supply chain. That, environment. So that's true. Question. I mean, the, the question is like, what, what did Nutcracker have to do to girder itself to say, you know what? Yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna accept responsibility even in this, um, very fickle and difficult to manage supply scenario that we're in? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's why I let other people do that kind of work. Uh, but I, <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. But more, more seriously, I think, you know, the, uh, one of the other applications for the series C was to, was to bring in, you know, more to fill out the leadership team. One of the, the best things that we've done is hire our chief operating officer, uh, John Steubenrock, who has an extensive background in manufacturing. Uh, he's been at multiple big pharmas, done uh, biologics, small molecules, having someone with, you know, 20 plus years of experience in running manufacturing facilities with that type of deep CMC expertise that spans manufacturing, quality, supply chain uh, has been critical for us. And having that in-house, I think, is what makes us confident that you know, his team can manage those sorts of risks. Now, nobody is immune to them. Big pharma gets hit by them. Small biotechs get hit by them. But having, having the, ex- the experience in-house to manage that type of risk that that's how we manage it. I, I'm certainly no, I'm certainly no expert in, in supply chain, uh, but I, I know people, we, we have people who are, who are on the team and that, and that's how we're managing that risk. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I didn't expect to, yeah, I, I certainly didn't expect you to, you know, give me a detailed formulaic plan to, uh, you know, trip, triple supply, you know, re- redundant supply and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, as chief business officer, you know, some of that certainly rolls up to you too. You know, if, if there's no supply to, you know, develop material, uh, the CBO is probably going to hear about it. So, um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, what, speaking of that, what, what, uh, like what, at this stage in your clinical journey, uh, you, I mean, you guys are, you're, you're entirely preclinical at this point, right? That's right. Yep. So, so in terms of like the material that, uh, that, that you are producing, are, are you producing like pre preclinical material to, to run tests? Like what, what, what would a sort of the manufacturing uh, output look like right now? So we produce a variety of materials. Some of them, as you mentioned, are preclinical, meant for use by our research team for evaluation of potential candidates, um, for doing certain types of experiments to characterize the performance of RNA. But we certainly do that. Uh, We also have our own in-house GMP facility, which I I mentioned previously. Uh, And right now, what that that facility is doing essentially is gearing up to supply our, uh, our GLP talk studies. Uh, so those will occur next year uh, in advance of our the start of our first uh, you know our first product entering the clinic in the second half of next year. Yeah. So you know that's you know most of our capacity right now is uh, most of it's getting doing all the prep runs uh, to be ready for GLP tox manufacturing, uh, and then we have a, a certain amount allocated for research production uh, just to continue to fuel the pipeline uh, and understand our therapeutics. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. So I, I like, as I said, I do want to get to those indications. Uh, and, and, and you did a great job kind of lining up for me, like, you know, that, that this, this was a platform uh, company prior to sort of becoming a, a, a pipeline development company. Um, so what, uh, you know, once that platform was, was, was realized and the potential was realized, what, what was it that sort of led Nutcracker down the, the indi- indication paths that it's gone down? 
So uh, it's a good question with a complicated answer, uh, and it's it's different for each of the indications. Um, so one of the things that we love about RNA is the ability to combine uh, multiple drug substances into a single drug product. Uh, and by that, I mean you can have multiple RNAs in, in a single drug, uh, which means you can encode, encode multiple therapeutic proteins with a single drug you give to a patient. Um, and this is really appealing. It's especially appealing in cancer, uh, where multiple, uh, a multiple mechanism attack, uh, mul sorry, multiple mechanism of action attack on a tumor is probably the, the most effective way to fight a tumor. Um, so that's where we started really around the, the sort of multi-component RNA therapies, uh, which brings us to our first indication, uh, which is really these HPV driven tumors. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in a lot of HPV biology um, across sort of the pre-cancer space all the way into the metastatic space. Um, so the lead indication for 250 or NTX250, which is the drug we're talking about right now, uh, will, will be uh, in cervical dysplasia, which is a precancerous condition driven by HPV. Um, and then we're also interested in potentially expanding that into things like you mentioned, head and neck cancer and cervical cancer, which are also largely or almost entirely driven by HPV infection. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, cervical dysplasia is very appealing. It's a big disease. It's a big problem. It affects a couple hundred thousand women every year in the United States, um, plus another 300,000 or so in Europe. Um, so it's a big problem. Um, and it, again, it's pre-cancer. It has to be treated. Uh, it has a substantial risk of progressing to cancer. Um, and the, the beauty, I think is the wrong word, but one of the, the features of the disease that make it appealing for these multimodal strategies is you can treat the disease locally. You, know, you can give the therapy locally in the cervix with the notion of destroying these precancerous lesions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think even more importantly with our drug is to eradicate the biological basis of the disease, which is HPV infection. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we think this is such a nice fit with our platform uh, is that we can use this multimodal approach. So we're not just trying to create T cells that go after HPV. We are essentially reprogramming the immune environment of the cervical tissue uh, to allow those T cells to be more effective. Uh, and that's why we're so excited about this product in this setting, because we can do that type of local immune reprogramming uh, and have our T cells be as effective as possible in destroying the root cause of disease, uh, which is, as I said, HPV. Yeah. Um, that was a lot of words. Uh, let me pause there. Let me ask you any questions on, on sort of what makes that such an appealing therapeutic approach in the setting of, of, of these uh, of cervical dysplasia. Yeah, no, it's a, I guess the follow up. So is that therapeutic approach uh, also um, applicable to other HPV, HPV driven tumors or is that specific to cervical dysplasia? No, so it should it should be effective in any in, in any um, HPV driven tumor. So we do have some interest in, in exploring uh, head and neck cancer as well as cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. um, those are more th those are different diseases insofar as they're generally um, they can be metastatic. They can get all over the body, um, mm -hmm. and so the local therapy has a, a more uh, a higher bar to clear. I think attacking local disease with local therapy has some intrinsic advantages. Um, particularly when you're talking about erasing the biological basis of disease. But uh, we do have some intention to explore these other indications, these later stage cancers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, okay, good. Uh, what other, what other, what other indications we. Okay. So we should touch uh, briefly on cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Uh, so yeah. that's another disease again, that is, by the name you might speculate, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is also locally accessible. Um, this is again, another disease where you can go after, uh, you can go after the disease with a cocktail of, of different uh, effector molecules encoded in RNA uh, to attack the cancer with again, multiple mechanisms of action at the same time. Again, very appealing to go after cancer in this manner because you have a, a better chance of getting all the tumor cells uh, and so this is not as far advanced as NTX250. Uh, 250 will be in the clinic in the second half of next year, or at least we're planning to have it in the clinic in the second half of next year. Um, again, supplied by our own manufacturing facility with, uh, with, with material that we, we produced here. Um, uh, 565 will, will be a little bit behind that. Uh, but again, it has a similar theme, different constructs, different proteins, but the notion of having a cocktail uh, approach uh, uh, that attack multiple mechanisms of action to clear tumors is fundamental to our strategy. Uh, and so that's why uh, uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma is a good fit for our technology and our platform. Mm -hmm. And then uh, genitourinary, that's a, a, a another, yet another candidate? 
Yeah, so that's another candidate. That's uh, NTX four seven zero. This one we haven't. There's there's more than one genital urinary tumor. Uh, so we're looking at things like prostate and bladder. Uh, here we're looking at fundamentally a, a more a, a different strategy. This would be a systemic approach uh, to therapy in which we would essentially be um, encoding a therapeutic protein in RNA. Uh, delivering it systemically, uh, having that protein be produced by the liver and then secreted into the bloodstream. And then that protein would circulate in the blood and, and, and um, have its therapeutic effect on the body. Mm. Uh, that's, this is a discovery stage program right now, which is why it doesn't have a specific indication. It just has ge genital urinary tumors. But we think there's a lot of real estate here uh, to be covered by systemically administered RNA uh, to produce a systemically distributed therapeutic uh, to attack later stage disease like metastatic cancer. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and, and as far as clinical activity, can you give us any indication as to when uh, the the lead candidate might be heading into, into clinic, what the so, filing protocol might look like there? So it will be second half of um, uh, 20, well, this may be uh, listened to in the future. So I'll say second half of 2023, mm -hmm. uh, in which we expect to file our IND and dose our first patient. Cool. Good deal. Hopefully more than one patient in the second half of 2023. Yeah. Yeah. If enrollment timelines permit. Yeah. It's a, it's second half of 2023 is a ways off from, from today's date. So we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on things. And if we need to have you back on for an update, we'll certainly do that. But, um, we're running short on time here, Dr. Nosrati. So I, I just want to wrap up with a few questions around, you know, perhaps what, what could stand in the way and how you're overcoming, uh, what, what could stand in the way. So what, what challenges remain, you know, for, for RNA delivery vehicles, uh, what challenges remain, um, to, between now and the and the point where we're actively ready to leverage RNA as a therapeutic uh, approach, and and again, I know that's a, you you pick pick one or two. I know it's a big question, but what are your thoughts there? Okay, uh, big challenges for delivery vehicles. Um, I think by and large is specificity of trafficking. So where does it go once you put it in the body? Mm -hmm. um, that's the holy grail for delivery is to be able to have targeting. Uh, there's some evidence that this can be done, but it, it, that the field is very nascent and there's a lot of, of, of just basic science to be done. But it's a, you know, if you can deliver to specific organs or specific types of cells, uh, then you are really touching on one of sort of like the, the holy grails of drug development, which is drug goes only here and nowhere else, uh, yeah. which is very, very challenging, as you might imagine. Um, I think the, the, I don't think RNA has so many hurdles so much as we've just, as I said previously, just barely touched the tip of what's possible. So it's going to be incumbent on Nutcracker and all the other RNA companies, of which now there are many, uh, mm -hmm. to really start to use RNA in many, many different ways. So I think it's, uh, the vaccines are fantastic and I'm delighted that they came about when they did, but yeah. there's so much more that can be done with RNA. Uh, and you know, whether it's encoding systemically distributed proteins uh, or um, encoding proteins that can't be produced conventionally, um, things like membrane proteins, which you, which you could never make in a recombinant manner and use as drugs. Uh, there's a ton of real estate out there uh, that needs to be explored using RNA as a therapeutic. And that's just the protein coding flavor of RNA not the gene silencing version of RNA. Yeah. So uh, that challenges out to the, the whole uh, drug development community, uh, not just for Nutcracker, uh, but it's very exciting. Like anytime you have a modality with this level of flexibility, with the, the speed at which it can be developed, uh, it's an exciting time to be in the space. For sure. It's an exciting time to be in the space. And to, to your point, there are a lot of, a lot of players in the space. How, um, how, how, how concerning is sort of the, the, the legal atmosphere, right? Like the IP and, and patent protection potentially down the road. Um, it's sound, you know, just to, to, to a, to a, a non-scientist who's not living that every day. It sounds like it's kind of the wild west right now. So the rapid, <laughs> the, the rapid value creation that occurred um, around the RNA, I mean, so the, the RNA vaccines are some of the best selling drugs you know, ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, so anytime there's that much money at stake, uh, there's going to be some litigation in all likelihood. And that's just uh, kind of the way it is. Uh, we've done our, we, we have, we think we have established a very strong IP position with regard to all of our technology that we found spaces uh, in the intellectual property landscape where we've been able to carve out our own, you know, unique, you know, space where we can operate. Um, 
that is probably the best you can feel about where you are uh, legally. Yeah. Um, it's a contentious area. I mean, it's not, I won't say it's at the level of say like uh, where CRISPR was a couple of years ago and still is to some extent. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, anytime there's this much value at stake, people are going to fight over it. They're going to compete for patients in the clinic and they're going to be legally over intellectual property. And that's just, that's part of the cost of doing business. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Nosrati, I've, uh, you've been more than patient with my questions. I know I've been bouncing all over the map, uh, during the course of this conversation. What, what did I bounce too quickly over? What haven't I asked you that I, that I should have, or that you feel, uh, you'd like to spend a little bit more time on? Uh, I think you've answered, you've asked all of the big questions. Um, I'm trying to think of anything really big that we missed. I'm just pondering. Well, no, if, I think we had a good conversation. You did, you did, you definitely challenged my mental agility some, which I appreciate. Um, and I'm glad we got to cover a wide range of topics. Um, this is an exciting field. There's a lot of technology being developed. Um, we're always happy to tell people about our platform uh, and we're excited about the potential of bringing these therapeutics to patients. Yeah. Uh, you know, in all fairness to you, Dr. Nosrati, I'll just explain to the audience, you know, and when, he, when Dr. Nosrati references his mental agility that I'm testing, I mean, obviously he's a very smart guy, but the way some of these things come together is we have a conversation. Hey, would you like to be on the podcast? Yeah, I certainly would. What would you like to talk about? Well, here's what I'd like to talk about. And then we actually get on the podcast and Matt doesn't do any of that questioning in any of the same order, nor does he stick to the script. He asks all sorts of follow-up questions that come out of left field uh, and jump into his fickle brain as the discussion unfolds. That's what Dr. Nasrat is referring to in terms of mental gymnastics. And I'm very grateful to him, as I said, for having the patience <laughs> to, to, to subject himself to these questions. So thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. We'll do it again sometime. Cause you guys are just, uh, just getting warmed up in a super hot space that we want to pay attention to. So we'll definitely have yeah. you on again, but uh, I, I thank you in the meantime for coming on now. No, yeah. as I said, my pleasure. And we're happy to come on again and chat. All right. So that's Nutcracker Therapeutics, Dr. Jeff Nosrati. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the business of biotech. We're produced by bioprocess online in partnership with Cytiva. Cytiva's commitment to the business of biotech is on full display at Cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com, where I invite you to subscribe to my newsletter. And if you're enjoying conversations with innovators like Dr. Nosrati, subscribe to the pod. Give us a review. And as always, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.